Decryption Why the Chinese Communist Party Always Criticizes the U.S. China's Evergrande shares tumble as Hong Kong trading resumes. It's all covered in today's China Truths. Decryption Why the Chinese Communist Party Always Criticizes the U.S. The United States has helped China a lot and is also friendly to Beijing. But why does the Chinese communist regime often consider the U.S. as the number one enemy and slam it? Below is a decryption from the NTD TV analysts. The CCP has a habit of scolding the U.S. Back to the end of 1950, in the early days of seizing power, the Chinese Communist Party under Mao Zedong launched the so-called socialist education movement in China that hated and despised American imperialism to forcibly eliminate the pro-American ideology and U.S. admiring ideology in Chinese society at that time. On July 14, 1956, when Mao Zedong was making a speech to people in Latin America, he again criticized U.S. imperialism as a paper tiger. This phrase was later forcibly instilled in generations of Chinese people. Most recently, on March 6, 2023, Xi Jinping, as the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, directly criticized the United States at the opening of a meeting of the top legislature in Beijing. He said, Western countries led by the United States have implemented all-around containment, encirclement and suppression of China, which has brought unprecedented severe challenges to the country's development. Such stinging remarks shocked the world. But why does Beijing always scold the United States? The U.S. has helped Beijing a lot. Has the United States bullied the Chinese Communist Party? From a historical view, not only did it not, the United States has repeatedly helped Beijing at critical moments. In 1969, the Soviet Union was considering a surgical strike on the Chinese nuclear testing facilities in Xinjiang amid the Sino-Soviet border dispute. On the eve of the incident, the United States tipped off Beijing, and at the same time warned the Soviet Union, as long as a nuclear missile leaves the Soviet border, the United States will determine that World War III would break out, and all cities in the Soviet Union would be within the strike range of the United States' nuclear missiles. In this way, the United States helped Beijing avoid a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. In 1972, because of the Cultural Revolution as well as anti-Soviet and anti-American actions, Beijing fell into a huge dilemma in domestic and foreign affairs. At this time, U.S. President Nixon visited China to save Beijing from danger. In 1978, the Chinese government was dragged to the brink of collapse by the Cultural Revolution and it had to carry out the so-called reform and opening up to save itself. The United States opened its door to Beijing and saved Beijing again. In the 1990s, when the communist regimes in the Soviet Union and Eastern European countries collapsed one after another, and Beijing was also facing a risk of collapse, the United States once again opened its door to Beijing. In 2000, the United States granted China the permanent normal trade relationship status, the most favored nation trade status. In 2001, the United States approved China's entry into the World Trade Organization. After that, American investment poured into China, and Chinese products were widely sold in the United States. Beijing has obtained huge benefits from the trade deficit with the United States. And in just 10 years, China has become the world's second largest economy. America is the friendliest country to China. In fact, looking at modern history, it is not difficult to find that, for more than a hundred years, the country that has helped China the most in the world is also the United States. At the beginning of the last century, the Qing dynasty signed the Xian Chou Treaty a peace agreement with 11 Western countries, after the Boxer Movement in China ended. The indemnity included in it totaled 450 million taels of silver, and more than 32 million taels were given to the United States. In 1908, the United States officially announced that it would return half of the indemnity to China to subsidize students studying in the United States. In order to send Chinese students studying in the United States, the Qing government opened the Tsinghua Preparatory School for Studying in the United States in Beijing, which was renamed Tsinghua University in 1924. From 1917 to 1921, the United States used the indemnity to establish Union Hospital and Union Medical College in Beijing. When China was most in danger during the anti-Japanese war, the United States provided China with a large amount of manpower, material resources, and financial resources, and sent a brigade of American volunteers, 
known as the Flying Tigers to China to fight in the Pacific battlefield. The United States also helped China become a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Also, so far, 5 million Chinese have become American citizens. They can enter politics and run for mayors, governors, ministers, congressmen, senators. Many Chinese people have become outstanding talents in other fields, and at least seven have won Nobel Prizes. These Chinese elites also support China in different ways. Three reasons Beijing regards the U.S. as its number one enemy. Though the United States has helped China a lot when it faces difficulties, Beijing would only lower its anti-American tone and brag about things like China-U.S. friendship and want to make use of the United States. On other occasions, Beijing speaks of hostile forces at home and abroad, which all refers to the United States. Whenever a major incident against Beijing's tyranny breaks out in China, Beijing will scold the interference of foreign hostile forces, and the most scolded is the United States. Whenever the relationship between China and the United States deteriorates, Beijing would also curse at the United States and slam the United States as the worst country in the world. Why can't Beijing remember the good things about the United States, but always regard the United States as the number one enemy, and curse at it? There are three main reasons. First, the ancestor of the CCP, Karl Marx, hated and opposed capitalism. He demanded that the communists use violence to overthrow the regimes of all capitalist countries in the world, and then replace them with socialism. This gene has been passed on to the CCP, so the CCP hates capitalism from the bottom of its heart. It hates the United States, the leader of the capitalist world, and proposes using socialism to defeat capitalism. Second, the Marxist-Leninist values that Beijing believes are fundamentally opposed to the universal values that the United States believes. Among the universal values, belief in God ranks first, from which freedom, democracy, the rule of law, and human rights derive. The United States advocates, respects, and guarantees that everyone enjoys freedom of belief, freedom of speech. But the CCP does not recognize universal values. It is not believing in God, but in false, evil, fighting which derives from it as autocracy, dictatorship, and lawlessness. Since the CCP came to power, it has been oppressing, deceiving, and enslaving the Chinese people. Third, the United States has no fundamental conflict of interest with the Chinese people, but the conflict of interest with the CCP is irreconcilable. Beijing has been engaging in the three monopolies, which means monopolizing truth, monopolizing power, and monopolizing the economy. The tri-monopoly has generated the most powerful families in the CCP, who use their power to monopolize all the most profitable industries in China. Since the Sino-U.S. trade war broke out in 2018, the conflict of interests between the U.S. and Beijing has been unveiled in front of people all over the world. The United States proposed that the real goal of U.S.-China trade is 301 stops, zero tariffs, zero barriers, zero subsidies, and stop the theft of U.S. intellectual property. For the Chinese people, this is a great thing. Everyone can buy cheap and high-quality American products, enjoy American education, medical care, and financial services, and freely use Google, Facebook, and Twitter to learn about the relationship between China and the world. However, for the rich and powerful families who rely on the three monopolies to obtain huge profits, and for Beijing, which relies on the Great Firewall to shield the truth and deceive the Chinese people, this is a terrible thing. Therefore, Beijing and the United States cannot agree with each other for the three above reasons. Coupled with its fighting nature, it is impossible for Beijing not to scold the United States. Children of senior CCP families love the United States. Ironically, the members and descendants of the families of senior CCP officials have a special liking for the United States, and they all love to go to the United States, and even don't want to leave there. The United States is one of the countries where the families and descendants of senior CCP officials choose to study, immigrate, and invest. Kong Dongmei, the granddaughter of Mao Zedong, once studied at the University of Pennsylvania in the United States, studying for a master degree in international communication and media. Deng Jifang, the son of Deng Xiaoping, studied at the University of Rochester in the United States and received a PhD in quantum physics. Deng Xiaoping's grandson, Deng Zhuidi, 
was born in the United States. Deng Xiaoping's granddaughter, Shui Yu, went to high school and college in the United States and graduated from Wellesley College in Boston. Jiang Mianung, the eldest son of Jiang Zemin, studied at Drexel University in Philadelphia in the United States and received a doctorate in electrical engineering. Jiang Zhicheng, Jiang Zemin's grandson, graduated from Harvard University with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from Columbia University. Hu Haiqing, the daughter of Hu Jintao, immigrated to the United States a long time ago. Xi Mingzi, the daughter of the current top leader Xi Jinping, studied at Harvard University. In addition, Yang Jiechi, former member of the Political Bureau of Beijing and director of the Central Foreign Affairs Office, has lived in the United States for more than 10 years with his wife and daughter. In 2021, Brian O'Shea, a professional American investigative expert, confirmed that Yang Jiechi's wife, Lu Jiamei, had been living in a property worth $8.1 million in Washington, D.C. His daughter, Yang Jiala, lived in an apartment in New York. There are countless such examples. For them, anti-Americanism is work, and going to the United States is life. The hatred towards the United States they hyped up is deceiving ordinary Chinese people. China's Evergrande shares tumble as Hong Kong trading resumes. China's Evergrande Group closed down 79% in Hong Kong trading on August 28 as shares of the real estate developer resumed trading for the first time since its unexplained suspension in March 2022. Shares listed in Hong Kong fell to 35 cents, with its market capitalization shrinking to 4.6 billion Hong Kong dollars, 586.29 million dollars, from 21.8 billion Hong Kong dollars, 2.78 billion dollars. The company's Hong Kong listed units, China Evergrande New Energy Vehicle Group and Evergrande Property Services Group, have both resumed trading in the past month after a 16 month halt. The trade resumption is crucial for the company because its offshore debt restructuring plan includes swapping part of the debt into equity linked instruments backed by them. Evergrande would have been delisted if the suspension had gone beyond 18 months. In its filing to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, Evergrande posted a 33 billion yuan, $4.5 billion, loss attributable to shareholders for the first six month period, less than the 66 billion yuan, $9 billion loss reported last year. The company had about 2.39 trillion yuan, $328 billion, in liabilities in the January to June period, lower than the 2.44 trillion yuan, $334 billion, recorded last year. Its total assets also decreased from 1.8 trillion yuan, $247 billion, last year to 1.74 trillion yuan, $239 billion, this year. Evergrande said that its board has reviewed its cash flow projections and believes that the company will be able to adequately fund its operations and meet its financial obligations as and when they fall due within the next 12 months from June 30, 2023. It stated, in the first half of 2023, China's property market has cooled down significantly, with the sales area of national commodity houses falling by 5.3% year-on-year. A number of real estate companies defaulted on their debts, further exacerbating the volatility in the market. The company said it had actively planned for the resumption of sales and successfully seized the short boom of the property market that emerged at the beginning of the year, achieving a comparatively substantial increase in sales performance. Evergrande recently filed for bankruptcy in New York on August 17. The filing under Chapter 15 of the U.S. Bankruptcy Code shields non-U.S. companies from restructuring from creditors coming after their U.S.-based assets. Evergrande's offshore debt restructuring totals about $32 billion, including bonds, collateral and repurchase obligations. The bankruptcy filing from Evergrande is feeding into growing fears in a country now struggling with a deteriorating real estate market and broader economic turmoil. Once China's second largest home builder by sales, Evergrande defaulted in late 2021 with some $300 billion of debt on its back. Companies accounting for 40% of Chinese home sales have since defaulted, and Country Garden, Another leading Chinese developer, on August 6 missed two dollar-denominated bonds totaling $22.5 million, leaving it with a 30-day grace period before it gets labeled a defaulter. 
As of now, Country Garden's total liabilities of 1.4 trillion yuan are second only to Evergrande. Evergrande said in a filing that its bankruptcy protection application to the U.S. court is a normal procedure for offshore debt restructuring and doesn't involve a bankruptcy petition. It clarified that its U.S. dollar-denominated notes are governed by New York law. Meanwhile, on August 28, the news about the liabilities of Evergrande sparked heated discussions among mainland netizens. On the one hand, netizens believe that Evergrande is a white glove of CCP officials and that Beijing will not allow it to go bankrupt. On the other hand, they worry that Beijing may pass on such debts to the common people. The topic of China Evergrande's debt of 2.38 trillion appeared on the mainland Weibo and Baidu's hot search lists. On the 27th, Evergrande issued an announcement on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange stating that as of June 30, 2023, the group's six-month revenue was 128.18 billion yuan, gross profit was 9.8 billion yuan, and the total net loss was 39.25 billion yuan. As of June 30, 2023, the total liabilities of the group were 2,388.2 billion yuan, which was 1,784.22 billion yuan after excluding contract liabilities of 603.98 billion yuan. The previous financial report data released by Evergrande showed that Evergrande's total losses in 2021 and 2022 exceeded 800 billion yuan. As of December 31, 2022, China Evergrande's total liabilities amounted to 2,437.41 billion yuan. After excluding contract liabilities of 721.02 billion yuan, it was 1,716.39 billion yuan. Many netizens left messages condemning Beijing officials for not allowing Evergrande to go bankrupt and keeping this debt-laden company alive. Some netizens questioned whether Evergrande is an official white glove. A netizen posted, doesn't Evergrande have any violations of laws and regulations? Really, as long as you owe enough and big enough, you won't be punished. Another one posted, there is a comment that is particularly good, personalization of benefits, socialization of costs, and universalization of risks. There were many other posts as well, such as. Look, 2 trillion 380 billion yuan. It is an astronomical figure in the legend. Who can make it oh so much? The top needs GDP, the core of China's GDP is real estate, the local area needs urban construction, and the bank needs to lend. They are all on the same line. Evergrande is just a facade. Evergrande has also fattened up many bank presidents. Concentrate on big things, collectivism is useless. It has dragged countless small companies to death. It has hurt a lot of people. Reuters reported earlier that Alan Locke, chief executive and chief information officer of Winner's Own Asset Management Limited, said, China's real estate industry is like a black hole. Since Evergrande, in trouble, two years ago, many developers have been dragged into it. The central government has yet to take, strong, steps because the hole is too big to fill. In addition to the aforementioned comments from netizens, there were other comments by netizens. The debt can rival a country, right? President Mu, referring to the French professional football player Mbappe, has an annual salary of 700 million euros. It will take more than 400 years to pay off Evergrande's debts without eating or drinking. I just searched, how much is 2.38 trillion? It is just enough for the public budget expenditures of the four first-tier cities of Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou last year. I just searched, and an aircraft carrier is tens of billions, and 2.38 trillion is enough to make dozens of aircraft carriers. Simple calculation, 2.38 trillion renminbi is equivalent to 320 billion US dollars, while Ukraine's GDP is only 160 billion US dollars and one Evergrande is equivalent to two Ukraines. Most of them are bond defaults. The interest is dead, and it is overdue. This amount is hopeless. In a few years, it will be 3 trillion, 4 trillion. Don't forget to leave a comment in the section below to share your opinions on today's topic with us. 
make sure to like and subscribe to see more interesting topics from China Truths. Thank you.